years, but we also have a lot of third party data coming out um, that's showing the real benefits to speed training for players, whether that's you know juniors or collegiate players or amateurs. We had some really cool stuff that we're going to share on that uh, today, which I'm really excited about. Um, my background, I'm a PGA professional, I'm a golf coach by trade who now you know, actually I was kind of more of a putting specialist before the whole super speed thing came along and now definitely have gone down that route of, uh, of speed. So I like to start these off just with a little bit of general talk here about what all we do currently to help people hit the ball further. So we're all golf. How many people coach primarily in this room? How many are primarily coach? Okay. Um, so what are the categorical pieces, the big picture categorical pieces that can help a player hit the ball farther. What, what affects how far a player can hit a golf ball? How far a player can hit a golf ball? Any ideas? Efficiency. Efficiency of what? Uh, okay, so efficiency of movement. I put that into a category that I call the physical. Okay, we'll do an analogy here in a minute, but I think physical is important. What else? I think there's four. Centers. Centeredness of contact, all of those fall into something I like to call impact physics. So anything you can measure on a track man, how the club head and that ball interact is going to obviously have a big impact on how far the ball goes. What else? We're getting into the nitty gritty here, but I mean, come on, we're all golf coaches. What do we talk about in the golf swing almost on a lesson by lesson basis? Okay, club head speed's really more than that impact physics piece. Ground force. Now we're starting to get there. What, what would like ground force and rotational sequencing, and, like lag and wrist mechanics, what would that contain? That's that swing mechanics, right? Swing mechanics important? Absolutely. Um, the last one is one that I would say groups get less often, and that's the newer stuff. That's what we do with overspeed training, and that's going to be more neurological training. That's how our brain controls our body and what our brain expects from our body when we pull the trigger in the golf swing. So here's a couple of those things. These are really those four. I like to use an analogy of a race car. Okay? If I want to make this car go as fast as I possibly can make it go around a track, so we're trying to get the fastest time around a track we can, what are the things that have to happen? What, what is important about this car to make that happen? How do we connect these together? Where does this analogy go? I mean, let's just say it's an oval track. It doesn't matter. What do you think? What would physical be? What would be the physical part of this car that makes it go fast? The engine. How big is the engine? You know, is it an equal playing field from a from a speed and power standpoint for a guy like John Rahm who weighs 250 pounds and is 6'4 versus like a Justin Thomas who's not? You know, is there potential? You know, so capacity is important. I think so. we can't negate that. A car that has a 600 horsepower engine has the possibility of going faster than a car that has a 200 horsepower engine. Everybody agree with that? Okay, 100%. Now, what, so if we're looking at that, that's the physicals like the engine. What would mechanics be in the car? Swing mechanics or what? That's all the like, the drive shaft and the gears and the steering wheel. I mean, if you don't have swing mechanics in the golf swing, you can't keep it on the track, so it doesn't matter how fast it goes. So I think it's another key point that impact physics is actually going to be a little bit more detailed. That's going to be what kind of tires are you using? How much downforce are you putting on the car? These are all of those pieces like in equipment fitting that optimize out for us to get the most out of how far we're hitting. Now the neurological side of this car is again probably the most important part and that's the computer that's in this car that makes all of these different systems work together. And our brain does the exact same thing for our golf swing. And it happens because of what we call motor units. Every single movement that we know how to do uh, as human beings lives in our brain. That's up here on this side. There are these little things called motor neurons in our brain that hold motor patterns. When we go out on the first tee and we select motor pattern to hit it down the fairway, we step up, we make that swing, an electrical signal literally starts in our brain, travels down our central nervous system, arrives in our muscles, and our muscles respond with that program motion. And that's a huge oversimplification of a pretty complex system, but that's really what happens in our body when we make the decision to make a movement, whatever that movement might be. 
Now, the other part of this system that's really important and very important to overspeed training and speed training neurologically in golf is that your brain expects your muscles to move at a certain speed. Okay? Does that make sense? You know, we, and you guys have seen this if you work with launch monitors out of the tee. Like, if you work with a launch monitor and you get out there and you have somebody swinging, you know, maybe hit four or five golf balls and say their driver speed somewhere around 100 miles an hour. If you ask him, all right, this next one, I want you, I want, I want longer. I want 20 yards further. I want this to be the fastest one you've got. What usually happens? How many people think they go faster? How many people think they go slow? In reality, I'm probably more on that side because they probably don't have a motor program in their brain that's five yards longer. They don't know how to do it, so they really can't. Okay, but really what happens is most of the time they stay the same because they run the same motor program. And they get the same expected result from that motor program. Okay? In order to change what the expectation, what your brain is expecting your body to do, we've got to somehow make the body move faster when we think we're making the golf swing. And that's what overspeed training does in its purest form. We found this first in baseball, actually. Uh, Major League Baseball players using different weighted balls um, to increase arm speed. Um, this is how it works in our super speed training with our sets. We have three clubs in all of our, our training sets, except for our counterweight clubs, which is just a single set training protocol. We can talk about that more later. Um, one club's 20% lighter, one's 10% lighter, and one's about 5% heavier. A player will swing that green club, which we always do the light clubs first, on average 19% faster than their normal swing speed. Now again, if you're somebody that works with launch monitors or knows how fast your player is swinging, is that a lot? <coughs> That's a lot. That's like somebody going from 100 miles an hour to almost 120 instantaneously. That's a big deal. Now what happens in just a few swings is that player's brain starts to expect their body to move at close to 120 miles an hour. So then we shock the system. We add a little bit of weight back. We go about 17% faster when we add that 10% weight back and go to that one that's 10% lighter. This was a piece of data that we knew we had something when we were seeing players with our red club, which is 5% heavier than the player's driver, still swing about 12% faster with that club during their training. If I give somebody that red club, or, or any heavy club, first in this process, what is going to happen? They will slow down 100% of the time. Okay? I'm not saying there isn't some advantage to some types of resistance training or heavy club training. There are things that that can help with. It's just not speed training. It may affect mechanics, it may affect sequencing, positively, which could have a result in speed, but speed training requires that you move faster than your normal motion. Whether you're training speed for sprinting or throwing or whatever it is. You're not training speed unless you're moving faster than you normally do. Overspeed training, which is a term we coined back in 2014 when we came out with this product, is just making your body move faster than normal during something it already knows how to do in order to change what the brain expects from the body. It's all this is. It's very simple. It's like taking the governor off the engine of that race. We have a bunch of different training protocols that we've built. We actually have years worth of training. All of this is available on our website for free. If you go to our website, go to the training tab, it'll ask you to register a free account. You have access to all of the different training we do. And now we have a lot of cool stuff that adds on to what we do um, with just the basic overspeed training as well. And that's really what I want to talk about today. It's a lot of the data, the studies, the other cool stuff that we've gotten, because I think a lot of you have probably seen some of this before. And now we're going to talk about a whole lot of stuff that you might not. The first one, counter or um, non-dominant training. This one's been one of the, this is kind of funny. I actually had a long talk with Scott Fawcett. We actually went out to his place in, uh, in Frisco last year and did a bunch of videos together with him. Uh, we're doing a lot of stuff to actually help him sell Decade because honestly, I can't believe that people won't use Decade. It's like, uh, you want to talk about low hanging fruit for people that want to get better. I mean, I I'm all in. But this was another, like, no self respecting fitness trainer or anyone would ever tell you to go in the gym and only train half of your body. It's crazy. We've done this forever in the golf world, but it just doesn't make sense. We actually, there's so many different advantages to non-dominant training, especially for players who are not in the gym four days a week 
uh, trade. I mean, some of the best players in the world are not only doing this in the golf swing, but they're also doing this with all types of different um, exercises in the gym, whether it's strength or mobility or explosive power, like you see Rory giving here, and uh, John will turn around and, and do some of those bed ball tosses the other way. Non-dominant training is a big deal. We've known this for a long time, and we've seen studies come out of other sports where even skill-related type accuracy-based stuff gets better when you train it on the non-dominant side as well. We used to have our kids in our junior programs we never let them settle on whether they wanted to swing a golf club right or left-handed until they were like almost nine, 10 years old. Up until that point, they were doing everything both directions, whether it's baseball, whether it's throwing, whether it's frisbees, whether it's golf, all of it. Uh, just creates more coordinated humans. Um, this is a study that I had a good friend of mine, Dr. Tyler Standifer, who's a professor out at Utah Valley University. Um, he's done a lot of research on our stuff. It was kind of a funny story with Tyler. He called us about three years ago. He was like, all right, I'm, I'm at a university. I need to do a bunch of research. I'm a golf nut. You know, my university will buy me whatever technology I want, which is just stupid. I mean, he's just bought like a $150,000 motion, uh, markerless motion capture system. He's got the best force plates in the world. Like, this guy's got an unbelievable setup out there. Well, he called me. Um, about because we are seeing some stuff come up about non-dominant training not being as effective as it could be and we're like well that's bullshit let's 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 figure this out so he calls me and he's like I just I, I think this is where I was like, all right Tyler why don't you just pull somebody out of the hall have them come in go through one super speed session but don't have them make any dominant side swings make them all non-dominant swings through the protocol instead of just yeah you know, so he made 39 non-dominant swings going through the different weights these were the results, well, we did that with one person. He calls me back like 15 minutes later, he's like, all right, so they got better. <laughs> they got a lot better. So, all right, Tyler, that's fine. We'll help you do another study. Do the study. Yeah, he had 22 players go through this. Um, these were players that only trained on the non-dominant side. So they never made, so we came, they came into his lab. He tested their dominance on their normal golf swing. He got forced data, he got all that kind of stuff. Had them do training for six weeks, only making non-dominant swings during the training. They never made a dominant side swing at all. And these are the kind of things that we, we saw in the study, which is just crazy. So we saw pre and post there on, uh, well, club speed, first of all. These were actually pretty fast players in this data set. They were starting above 109 miles an hour after they were 116. We had vertical force gains, that's about 20%, which is crazy. Um, 13% gain there. Um, AP force is another one that we've started to look at a lot more recently as far as a very strong correlation to swing speed. That's actually how much force the player is pushing toward the target in their lead foot as they uh, on the downswing. So that would be like your players that early extend and kind of come off the ball. Or <coughs> so, like tour players push toward the ball, which pushes the pelvis around and keeps their posture. That one went up by 30% on these players. And yeah, they never made a dominant side swing. So anyway, cool study. Non-dominant training's in there for, to stay. We will have it in every protocol we do forever. We also saw that this is going back to regular training. So this is going to be training when you're doing the protocols as we have them described. So that's going to be your dominant side swings followed by non-dominant swings, which we still feel is the best way because we're going to get a little more, I would say, transfer to get it out of the golf course when we add in the dominant side swings. We like the fact that the player's applying these fields to their actual golf swing. So that's really what this training does, right? This training helps you feel what it feels like to make the club move faster and with those lighter weights allows the body to move faster. There's a lot of that on the motor learning side that we do. Um, we have some cool tracking technology that uh, we can talk about, we have out here that we can demo for you if you'd like as well. But in general, normal training, we see about a 10% gain in peak vertical force, which is a lot. Uh, Tyler always says that you know if his athletic department came to him, and, or if he could go to his athletic department and say, how many of your players would you like to see an increase in 10% vertical force production in like six weeks? Like every single player on every team would be doing that tomorrow. Um, we also see some cool stuff about when those forces happen. So for those of you that work with ground force stuff, you'll probably see a lot of players, especially amateurs, who peak the amount of vertical force production they have in their swing late. So it peaks very late in the process, and that's not very efficient. 
Um, this was a player that started out the red as a before line. He was only at about a, a little under 100% um, body weight to force, which isn't that great. After he went up to about 140%, but it also went back to about 83% of the way through the downswing as opposed to add impact, which again, we could talk about this probably for its own two hour session, but um, let's just say it got a lot better. Um, we actually think the ground reaction force piece is so important. We partnered with a company uh, called Force Pedal. Um, they're made by the same company that makes those red and blue force plates called Smart to Move. Uh, some really smart guys out of France developed these little products. Um, they're really just a feedback mechanism in order to help people push on the ground the right way. Um, as a coach, I think that might be one of the most effective things that can create big change throughout the entire golf swing. When players are not pushing on the ground effectively, the ground is not helping that player swing work. And we want all of those forces created to help the body work as efficiently as possible. So that's another really cool product that we, we work with. Um, as far as like tracking super speed training, we have two main ways that I think are, uh, one that's newer, one that's been around for a little bit. One is radar. We use uh, the PRGR launch monitors. If you've ever had any experience with that, it's a very easy to use, simple, I think it retails for $230. You guys get wholesale on all of our products, so they're like $160, I believe, on your end. But um, the PRGR just sits down and can see how fast something moves when it goes in front of it. Which for us is great, because it can measure how fast our super speed clubs move when you're not hitting a golf ball. Which has been the hardest thing for every other launch monitor company in the world. That's kind of, I, I would love to talk more about the whole motor learning side of how we develop these protocols, but it's a big deal to know how fast these things are moving. Because if you swing at 100 miles an hour and that first green club swing only goes at 105 when you're doing the training, you're either not trying hard enough or you haven't um, really worked very hard or anything like that. Um, you haven't made that club move faster, so you don't know what it feels like, right? So if I now it goes up to 120, oh, that's what it feels like. So now you have a feel to remember, and that feedback is going to make a big difference in what you're able to do as far as training goes. We also recently partnered with Blast Motion, and now have a fully integrated app-based experience, if you like that, um, where the Blast Motion sensor can go on top of all of our super speed clubs. We help them develop air swing mode in their app. So now you can make swings in air swing mode, um, and capture data on practice swings with the blast sensor. The blast sensor is a 3D sensor that goes on the top of the club. Um, put it on there, it'll actually walk you through the training protocols, it'll auto capture all of the swings, um, which is a really cool thing. I, I think it, it'll walk you through the protocols, collect all your data, give you history. Um, we can show you more about blast motion up there as well. All right, this is another study that Tyler did with uh, senior players. I think this is pretty important. Average age, or the age range here was 58 to 89. Uh, again, we saw kind of the similar things that we always see. We see about a 5% gain, 5 to 6% gains in swing speed is what we see. Um, so I think that was another one I wanted to share with you. Uh, another really cool study, I think this might be one of my favorite we've ever done. This is definitely one of Tyler's favorites he's ever done. Uh, we worked with a company called ShotScope. So ShotScope, um, ShotScope has little markers that go on the clubs and GPS and basically can track every single shot that you make out on the golf course. It's kind of like Arcos works a similar way. It's basically stat tracking for amateurs. So Tyler got a set of a testers, set of golfers, um, had them come in. We got baseline data about a month into the golf season in Utah. We then had them go out on the golf course for a month straight, record as many rounds as they could, get every single shot that they hit to see, because we're looking what's actually happening, what's actually happening out on the golf course with all of this, right? So we got those golfers in, they learned how to use the system, we then got data on force production and club speed and all those kind of things in the lab as well. Those players then went, went out and did our speed training protocols and did our speed training for six weeks, came back in, we got data, and then we had them go back out on the golf course and track all of their stats for another month. Right? So we really got actual before and after data on the golf course of what speed training can do to affect performance. Well, we saw a couple things. We saw distance increase by 4.9%. That's pretty much on par with what we see typically inside, so it's cool to see that that's happening out on the golf course. How many people think 
that because they're now hitting it 5% further on the golf course, that they're going to be hitting it in the rough more often, or they're going to have more penalty shots. Anybody, anybody kind of, you know, we hear that online all the time. Well, I'm just going to hit it further into the woods, right? We actually saw their accuracy increase by over 10%, okay? Does that shock anybody? All right? Yeah, this is a kind of an interesting point. I've said this for a long time, but it's nice to have real data that proves it. As players work more athletically, as they sequence better, as they become more efficient with the way they move, not only are they going to increase their power production and their speed ability, they're also going to become more consistent with the way they deliver the club. They're going to actually become more consistent and a, a more accurate player as well. And this is just the first of many studies we're going to do that are proving that. What do you think this did to those players' scores? <clears throat> Average of 2.7 strokes better per round. As Scott would say, as you're just up here, this is pretty low-hanging fruit. Like if you're playing, and this is only six weeks of training. I mean, we have three years worth of this training. Two-thirds of the active tour players in the world have put a speed training regimen as part of their normal daily routine to golf now. So, I mean, if this isn't something you're doing with your players, I think it definitely should be. All right, I got one, well, we can, C Club is another cool, we can talk about this one out of the table. I got one more thing I gotta get to before Scott pulls me out of here. Um, but C Club has also seen some really cool things. It's a counterweighted version of our Super Speed Clubs, has its own protocols, really works on direct translation of body speed to uh, hand and arm speed down toward impact. So it kind of uses over speed training right about the impact zone. Um, I can show you more, but we did another study with the counterweight club, uh, actually seeing a higher increase in ball speed than we did with our other studies compared to club speed, which again, that's kind of what we're looking at, right? We're looking at theory right on impact, so it's kind of cool to see that. All right, this is the last piece that we're going to talk about today, and I promise I'll let you guys out. Um, how many people test grip strength with your players? Anybody? Oh, we got one of those groups. So this was like one of the most common devices we would have at our golf academy. And this is just, it's just called a dynamometer. It basically measures how hard you can squeeze something, okay? And uh, we've got a ton of data on professional players, amateur players, everything across the board about how hard they can squeeze. How many people in here, you know, what, what, is the, what do you guys teach your players as far as grip pressure? Oh, yeah. I just want to tell them, grip press is directly related to the speed of the pussy. Meaning what? It's on a flat swing, it's about a third, I mean, a two thirds slower than your four swing. Oh, no, 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 I'm talking grip pressure. Oh, the exact numbers? Oh, yeah, well, no, I mean, how, what, do you, what do you teach them? What do you tell people? So you get somebody out there squeezing the crap out of the club, what do you tell them? Everybody's scared to say, come on, it's like a little bit like a baby bird, maybe like 50% of how hard you can rate. That's what we tell people. Like, come on, I'm a coach too. I've done the same thing. I'm in there. We used to test it, and we started to feel that this was one of the largest epidemics of, I would say, speed production for amateur players all over the world. Okay? I'm going to show you that with data here. So here's what we got. So we, if we look at tour players, on average, PGA tour players can create about 60 kilograms of static grip pressure on each one of their hands. Okay? It's a little bit stronger always with everybody on uh, their dominant, their lead side hand, their lead hand, even if you're right-handed, your left hand's actually going to be able to produce a little more grip strength. And there's tons of studies out there on this that will show that across the board. Um, so 60. We actually also looked at uh, world long drive competitors. I mean, they're probably the fastest in the world, right? I'd like to know what they have. They average about 82, so they're even higher, okay? Next, let's look at amateurs. Amateur males from our data set are looking at about 42. That's not nearly as much as tour players, is it? Okay, how about amateur females? We're down in that 27 age. That one, we're gonna need some more data to look at some of those details. So, what do you think? Number one, where is the most grip pressure created during the golf swing? Where do we have the most grip pressure on the club in the golf swing? It's the logical piece. It's in transition. So as we transition the club, we're going to apply the most force to the golf club. We're going to have the most grip pressure at that point. All right? How much do you think, well, I'll just let you know. 
So here you go. The tour players on average at that point are about 35 kilograms. That's about 58% of their max. I think that says pretty much what we've always said. You don't want it to be really, really tight. It's gonna, that's probably going to feel, you know, not definitely your max. Lingerie players are at 44, but that's only 53% of their max. Amateur males are at about 32. That's 75% of their max. Isn't that crazy? All right. Female amateurs, we don't really have enough in the data set to tell you yet, but I will tell you one number for sure, and as that number gets below about 24, what happens? Club goes flying out into the driving range. Okay? That's pretty wild, right? So that means we have Mrs. Jones out on the driving range, say she's 55 years old, can only muster about 26, 27 kilograms of grip pressure, and you're telling her to grip it like a light bird and to hold the thing as easy as they can through the swing, you're literally telling her to throw the club out into the range. Kind of wild, but I mean, just some of these thoughts that we sell the same people the same thing every time. I, I would propose at this point, and again, we're collecting a lot more data on this, even on the LPGA Tour, grip strength is an absolute epidemic causing people to not be able to maximize how much uh, speed and power they're able to create. What kind of things are going to happen in the golf swing if you've got somebody that doesn't have enough grip strength to stabilize the golf club? Any ideas? I mean, I think there's all kinds of things. I think the very first one is task, because if I the, the first thing that I need to do in transition, if I want to lessen how much grip strip pressure I need to hold on to the club, is going to be release it like this, and it's not going to need nearly as much. So if I'm trying to maintain any type of lag or downstream loading in my golf swing, I can't do that if I can't stabilize and if my hands aren't strong enough. So how do we train grip strength? Well, we all agree that this might be something you should add into coaching your players. It might help, maybe. Good to test. By the way, this is kind of a fancy dynamometer, but you can buy these things on Amazon for like thirty dollars. And I would, I mean, I'll tell you this: every time I'm out at TPI, it's really interesting. We teach in their speed, in their uh, power protocols, we sponsor them forever. I love the guys at TPI. The place can get a little bit of a mess if you can't find stuff. Greg Rose can find this thing in his in, in, in where, and whenever I'm there, it's like in the first drawer on the. So if there's some behind the scenes type stuff that's going on, people have been testing grip pressure on professional players for a long time, and I don't think amateur coaches have gotten the message yet, but it's time. So how do we train grip strength? What's the most traditional way to train grip strength? It's to lift really heavy shit. I mean, literally, like that, that's how we do it. Like most people have trained grip strength, or high level athletes have a lot of grip strength, because they're lifting barbells, or they're lifting dumbbells, they're lifting things that are heavy, and that naturally creates more grip strength. There's other ways to do it. There's these things called uh, fat grips. So if you have somebody in the gym that's really deficient in grip strength, you put these fat grips on that actually activate more muscles in the player's hands, and that actually uh, accelerates their ability to create more grip strength. Well, we kind of put those, those couple things together and we're coming out with a product that's launching actually in about a month. It's called the Super Speed Squeeze. So it's essentially like a fat grip trainer for the golf swing. Um, this is going to have its own protocols. Like we have, they're very simple protocols. They involve like isometric hard squeezes. They involve like fast burst type squeezes. But you can actually swing the golf club. Well, players make dominant side swings and non-dominant side swings with this. Um, we don't have a lot of depth or data yet because this is a brand new product. Um, but we had Tyler do about a four-week course with, with this protocol. Um, we saw about, on average here, um, we saw about a five and a half, six percent increase in static grip strength in four weeks of doing this. Um, we actually also saw about a one and a half mile an hour increase in driver speed in that same period with those players. So that's kind of why. There's going to be a whole lot more coming on this, but um, we have a few samples here. If you guys want to, you know, over the table, test your grip strength, see where you are. Um, you might be shocked. Like, it's amazing. Um, you know, Fawcett would tell you this was actually a major piece of Bryson's training. He was somewhat deficient in this prior to going through a lot of the physical training he did. One of the ways he was able to get faster, too. So, kind of cool stuff. All right, everybody. Speed Clinics, we have information out there. If you haven't run a Speed Clinic program at your facility, give this a shot. 
this is a fantastic way to not only generate direct revenue, but we've found this to be one of the highest client acquisition tools that you can possibly put in. It's a really simple program. You basically have 10 students. We recommend charging about $400 for that program, but that includes a set of our super speed clubs. So that's going to be a $230 value for your players. You guys get wholesale on everything we do, so that's about $1,600 back. That's $2,400 of profit for three hours of total work because they're half-hour clinics. It's all you need to do this training. It's an $800 an hour program that is completely scalable. Uh, I've largest speed clinic we've ever taught in person had about 80 people in it down at the PGA show. So if you've got a ballroom like this if, or outdoors to range any place to do this, if you haven't tried this program, we have information on that. Um, I'm going to be heading out probably a little after lunch. I have another seminar to get to up in Canada um, tomorrow. But Harley's going to be here all day, and we have product. We have all this stuff you can try. If you need any of this, you guys always get wholesale on everything we do. Uh, we have some other specials running on uh, multiple set orders and things, but uh, we can talk to you all about that at the uh, at the table out there. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you guys for being here. Um, probably don't have much time for questions, but if anybody has any questions, I can try to hit them before I get the hook. Yeah. Um, do you guys have any data on how uh, distance control with wedges is affected by speed training or any of our proximity? Distance control with wedges. That's one that we have not directly studied. Um, again, I would I would say again, as players become more efficient with the way they move, we tend to see most everything get better. I'm not going to probably try the argument of you know do speed training; it'll certainly help your wedges. But I would definitely be say work on your wedges at all times to work on distance control. I'm not sure there would be a direct correlation there. That would be really easy to find. Well, I guess then, how does speed training affect? <coughs> wedge play or wedge systems or? I mean, it's going to change how far you hit them because it will change your swing speed with your wedge. It's like that 5% gain goes pretty much through the back. So I would just say if you work with some type of launch monitor, which you probably should be doing to know exactly how far you hit your wedges with different types of swings, different motor patterns for slightly different motions in the wedge game, um, I would just say you need to still do that work to know exactly how far you hit each club. All right, anything else? Thank you guys, we appreciate it. We'll be around for a little while.